Okay, stick around. We're going to be moving on uh, with our next speaker now. I was just chatting to him, uh, Matt Meisnick. So he's from 6D.ai, also one of the partners at Super Ventures as well. So a big round of applause for Matt. All right, thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, I'm Matt from 6D. Uh, we are a, a company that's a spin out from Oxford University that really builds you know, really deep tech computer vision uh, to solve some really hard computer vision problems for you know, AR developers and creators. But what I wanted to talk about today is less about um, you know, 6D and the, the how things work and the what things are, but more about the why. You know, why I started this company, why we're trying to solve uh, an important problem and really what it's gonna mean to everybody working in the you know, AR and eventually VR space. Um, Alex, Alex Chung talked earlier about the AR Cloud and gave a great overview of, of what it was. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about why you know, the AR Cloud matters. Um, the thing that fascinates me about AR is that it's a, you know, natively as a medium, it's a deeply immersive and sensory experience. It engages us you know, in a way that no other medium can. And the sad fact of it is that today, all of our AR experiences are pretty much islands. If you use an AR core app or a you know, HoloLens experience, you're there on your own, you're experiencing it on your own, and you can barely get a sense of what it's like uh, to connect all of those senses in the way that the medium has the potential to, to another person. So um, that problem, you know, I've been working on it now for 10 years almost, 6D is my third, you know, third company, third attempt to solve this. And it's been a uh, really, you know, really challenging problem to solve. How do you, you know, build the infrastructure that connects apps to each other? And by connecting those AR experiences to each other, how do we then connect ourselves to each other and to the world in ways that you know, have been impossible to now? So as um, you know, Ori and I and Tom and we're talking about the problem here and what has to happen. You know, how do how do these experiences you know, persist when devices aren't there? How do you have a model of the world that's bigger than can fit on a phone or on a headset? We realized that a lot of the um, enabling pieces for these experiences needed to live in the cloud, and so that's where you know the term AR cloud came from. It was what parts of the AR enablers you know, live outside the device somewhere out there you know, in the cloud. And that has turned out to be you know, a big idea. There's a, it, it goes a long way in terms of enabling um, you know, what AR can be and what its potential can be. So the bridges, you know, each of these islands here is a little AR app. You know, what are the bridges and what do they look like? How does this, you know, what does it mean really? Um, how's it different from you know, the regular cloud? And you know, at, its, you know, at its heart, if you look at a, um, you know, the way an AR system works, you, know, you may have heard terms like point clouds or SLAM, um, those you know, maps, those sorts of things. But in this image, each of these, um, you know, each of those three images is a different AR system with its own you know, SLAM map or SLAM point cloud you know, of the world that it's looking at. And it's been, you know, impossible until recently to even really share those maps between devices. And it's that ability to share them and aggregate them, and combine them, and then derive some meaning from them that is what the AR cloud you know, enables. And I, I'm talking AR cloud in, in the singular, but really it's a, you know, it's, it's a whole universe of, of different services, and it's not necessarily one company that's going to own them all, but in aggregate, we're referring it to the AR cloud. So, if you can solve this problem of, of, of sort of merging these computer vision systems together and getting all the device, headsets to talk to phones and phone, you know, iOS to talk to Android and all that sort of stuff, what starts to become possible? And we've seen with um, iOS 12 and Google's AR Cloud Anchors and you know, stuff that we've done at 6D, you now start to have you know, multiplayer and persistent um, content. These have been features that have really blocked AR from being you know, feeling real, I guess. You know, the, the content needs to, for the content to feel like it's part of the world and for people to suspend disbelief. Um, if you put something digital in a place, you want it to stay there. And if someone else comes along, you want them to be able to also see it. And 
the interesting thing about this is that because a lot of um, the early developers in AR have had to have knowledge of 3D, you know, 3D content and building 3D experiences, a lot of them have come from the gaming world. And so terms like multiplayer have kind of stuck for this type of experience. But um, when you think about you know, this new medium, if you only look at it through the lens of like a gaming or an entertainment you know, product, then you're probably missing about 90% of the potential. If you, think of, if you swap out the word multiplayer and start using words like sharing or social or communicating, that's what this starts to enable. Like, How do we communicate in this new medium? How do we share experiences with each other, that someone who may be with us or maybe remotely? And so that ability for multiplayer to be a seamless, persistent experience is um, fundamental for you know, AR and VR to get outside of a, of a sort of a game console sized you know, market and eventually reach out into a, a smartphone sized market. Now, you know, anyone who's played with an AR Core or AR Kit app has probably had the, the experience of, of dropping an asset and then walking around the corner and you can still see the asset where it should be hidden behind a wall. Um, you know, that's called occlusion or you know, physics where the, the content should physically interact with the world. And uh, you know, my friend Charlie, who's about to speak next, you know, talks about painting the world with data. And what that starts to look like is, you know, in this case, it's a Minecraft-style game that the Microsoft showed off. You're, you've got content on all different surfaces. It's physically interacting. And it's effectively, you know, you're taking digital content and smearing it all over the world. And that's a really cool you know, experience, a cool user experience. But the trick with doing this is that before you can paint the world with data, you need actually a digital model of the world to paint on. And in this case, it's, it's just showing like a, a mesh of, the, of a couch. And up to now, getting that model has always been a chicken and egg for any application developer. Because to build a 3D model of, you know, of this room or of, of your home, you've either needed um, to take a, you know, a thousand photos and upload them to a server and do some sort of photogrammetry with a whole bunch of manual cleanup, or you've needed to use hardware that has you know, an active depth camera and you're restricted to things like Google's Tango phones or you know, HoloLens and Magic Leap, and it was never a mass market solution. And so while ever um, it was gonna be expensive to, be, to capture that content, no one was going to do it you know, at a large scale unless there was you know, an application to take advantage of it. And no one was going to build the application you know, that took advantage of the 3D world unless that model was there. So that chicken and egg has always existed. And um, I guess the reason I started 6D was I met my co-founder, and uh, you know, Professor Victor Prisakaru from Oxford University, and his computer vision lab had really figured out a way to build a model of the world um, in real time in the background on a regular mass market phone. So you didn't need any special hardware anymore. And so application developers could just assume that that model was there. And if the model you know, wasn't already there, we could build it as the app you know, built out. And so in this case, you know, from one of our little demo apps, as you just wave your phone around, it captures a model of the coffee table and of the basket, and you can throw some digital balls, and they, you know, they bounce around appropriately and, and get captured in, that, um, you know, in the basket. So that's all kind of cool. But then the first question when we show this off, that after people get over it, they say, well, look, what happens when someone walks in front of you? you know? And so Niantic showed a, a demo or a concept video about a month ago of uh, Pikachu like running between people's legs. And so the AR cloud starts to go to that next stage of having some intelligence about your scene and occlusion. And this is where Google's investing a lot in their lens product. You know, we're also investing in this space. And you start to be able to track you know, moving objects in a scene and identify what they are. And so your applications start to become very aware of the real world. You know, and they can start to, you know, as an application developer, you can start to you know, put logic into your apps to respond appropriately. You know, if, if there's a tree in the scene, your Pokemon might know to go and hide in the tree. If there's something you know, nav giving you navigation around, you know, around the street corner, the line will be you know, occluded as it goes around the corner, or occluded if a car goes in front of it. So these are all the sorts of enablers that are going to change the way um, 
they change the type of apps that we're able to build. You know, we get from, you know, like, like this example shows, work, AR apps that work on like a tabletop or on the corner of a room to really world scale apps. And the challenge um, in doing this is to build out the AR cloud features. You know, like, like Alex mentioned, you need to build a, a, literally a one-to-one -one scale model of the real world that is you know, almost updated in real time as things change. So it's a huge problem um, and a huge opportunity. You know, but it's not enough. Um, this is one thing I learned from trying to solve this problem several times before. It's that putting aside like the application itself, you know, your menu items, the quality of your graphics, the, you know, the, the user flow through your app, but the computer vision itself is a user experience. And just because something works doesn't mean it's good enough, as the, you know, the, the, the plug shows. And um, we've seen how, you know, in over 10 years, you know, we've had AR that, that worked. And if you're <coughs> willing to ask a, a consumer to print out a piece of paper and put it on the ground with a, with a marker on it, you could get a good AR experience. If you're willing to build by hand, you know, a, a model of a, of a solid object and sort of manually line it up, you could get occlusion and stuff working. But getting from that works to, to something that just works, which AR Core and AR Kit you know, achieved a, a year ago. That's when you know, the game changed for AR and in particular. Anyone could just open their phone and turn their phone on and just have a piece of content appear. And so that's now like today's challenge for multiplayer and persistence and occlusion. You know, how do you get it to be something that just works for everybody? But even that you know, isn't enough, because you've built now this amazing data set, you've made it really easy to use for everyone, but what people start to realize is that, hang on, if I'm playing Pokemon in my kitchen, you know, has Niantic just sucked up a model of my kitchen and they're holding it on their servers and what, are they, what the hell are they gonna do with that? And so privacy, even more than, you know, your search history, it, it matters, it, you know, it, it's even more sensitive. So the responsibility, I think, for companies like ours, as well as you know, the Facebooks and Googles of the world, is to be you know, very visible, very proactive, and really start to engage with people as to you know, what do you expect? Because there's a lot of um, you know, pre-existing norms that we're happy with. You know, if you come to my house and I invite you for dinner and you're in my, my lounge room and you pull your phone out, I don't immediately like freak out thinking that you're about to record a video of my, my home, but even if you did take a photo, I'm probably gonna be okay with that. But if you're wearing you know, magic lip glasses and you just happen to wander down the hallway and, and happen to glance into my kid's bedroom, you know, has Magic Leap now got an image of my kid's bedroom you know, on their servers? And so the trick is only partly technical. You know, a big part of the um, you know, solving this problem is gonna be around helping people understand and have sort of informed consent as to how this data is being used and how it's not going to be used uh, down the track. And you know, as an example, you know, today we could capture this type of mesh with you know, photorealistic content and save it in our servers, but we've chosen not to. And instead, you know, a similar scene, it looks like this. You know, it's something that from, from our point of view, we can't actually take this data and turn it back into an image that someone can, you know, any human could read. So that sort of one way translation is, is I guess one step we're taking, but there's gonna be far, far more problems down the road. And I think that the attention that's being placed on privacy, you know, over the recent Facebook scandals and things is something that we're gonna to have to care much, much more about as we get into AR and, and some of these cloud enabled services. Because one of my favorite slides, you know, there is no cloud. You know, at the end of the day, it's just someone else's computer that that data sits on. So uh, how, do we, you know, how do you make sure that that other person is, uh, is acting responsibly and, and treating your data with, uh, with respect? So um, everything I described, even if we solve these problems, like we solve the technology, we solve the privacy, we make it really easy to use, that's, it's still not enough, because this is really the beginning of a, a, a platform shift in the sense of going from PC to mobile, or mobile to whatever, AR, spatial, whatever name it ends up being called. But this 
transition from building apps that live on flat screens to building apps that have some awareness of the real world is going to be sort of the next decade, I think, of opportunity. And what that's going to result in is, is effectively a new type of operating system or operating platform. You know, historically, um, an operating system has meant you know, a bunch of APIs that developers can call to access you know, the hardware of the device and, and drive the UI. And then about I don't know, 15 years ago or so, you know, the APIs for shared services started to become you know, essential for every app that you built. And you know, Amazon Web Services, you know, they, they give it this name, Web Services, but from an application's point of view, it's almost an operating system for the cloud. You know, it's I save files, I retrieve files, I pass things around. And in the same way, we're going to need another set of APIs to understand the real world. And that, from the application's point of view, is going to look like an operating system in itself. And it's far more than just, you know, here's the, the mesh or the geometry of the real world, or here's the you know, coordinates of everybody so we can do multiplayer. The advances in you know, neural networks and deep learning I mean we're going to have beyond just identifying things like knowing that's a chair or you know, your name, it's going to start recognizing you know, gestures, start recognizing emotions, and then even start to be predictive in what's going to happen. In that if, you're, if, you see a, you know, if your system sees a ball bouncing along the sidewalk, you know, your autonomous vehicle might know to preemptively slow down because often children are running behind a ball that bounces on the road and they can start to predict to what happens. So this um, you know, real world operating system is really going to be that platform that you know, we believe is going to be ultimately the most valuable asset of the next you know, platform transition. You know, similar to, like Alex said, similar to Google Search Index or Facebook Social Graph. And um, it's a hugely important, you know, hugely important topic that's eventually going to affect you know, all of our lives. So uh, in finishing up, you know, AI Cloud, when you hear that term, um, it's not like a one thing. It's not just a one sort of someone building a big model of everything. But it's really a, a set of you know, APIs, a set of capabilities that are going to change what AR apps are capable of. But the reason for that, the reason that we do it all is going back to right at the beginning, is to really unlock that potential of AR to literally change how we see the world and start to connect ourselves you know, in ways that we can't currently do to, you know, to people, to places, and to things in our lives. So thank you.